Welcome to a new series of the Hip Talks podcast, a collection of discussions on legal topics hosted by Hugel and Ip solicitors. We provide high quality legal services with integrity, professionalism and respect for our clients and the community. Our solicitors have achieved outstanding results and recognitions in the areas of dispute resolution, corporate and commercial, private client, probate and trust, family, employment, business immigration and data privacy. Hello everyone, I am Carly, a trainee solicitor of Hugel and Ip. Today, I have the pleasure to discuss the topic of children custody with our firm's partner, Alfred Ip. Hello. Hello, Alfred. Let me first um, give a brief introduction on children custody. As you have discussed with um, Thelma Kwan in a previous episode of the Hip Talks, we know that divorce is often a complicated and turbulent process. It only gets more complicated when children are involved. Two main concerns regarding children and a divorce are care and control, more commonly known as child custody, and child maintenance payment, more commonly known as child support. So to start off, can you tell us what factors do the court take into consideration when awarding custody of children in divorce? Can you imagine when two parents are fighting over each other and uh, the children sometimes could be caught in the middle. Actually, when the court is considering um, a divorce, the child benefit and interest will be first and paramount consideration. And when the children are going through a turbulent time, the first that the court may think is, what would be the current status? And how are the children being looked after? And if only there's very, very pressing issue. Otherwise, the court will try to maintain the status quo. In order to stabilize the situation and deal with any sort of dispute or issues that the parents may have among themselves. And uh, in that respect, a lot of t- situation, there will be a main caregiver of the, um, the children. Um, a lot of time it would be the wife, no matter whether she's working or not, um, she would spend probably more time with the children, looking after them, feeding them, um, um, looking after their homeworks, playing with them. While a lot of time, the father would also spend a lot of time with the children, looking after them. Um, there would be a main caregiver, and that main caregiver could probably be the mother. And uh, the mother may be... Um, awarded with um, the main responsibility of looking after the children in that case, and uh, she would be given care and control. And uh, the husband, the father in that case, will probably be awarded like reasonable assets. But what the assets frequency and the, the mode of assets will be something that will be discussed a little bit later. And in that respect, if the parents cannot agree with each other, um, the court will look at a lot of um, situation, including um, the current situa- arrangement, um, the future proposed arrangement, and uh, sometimes the children's own wishes will also be looked into. And um, unless there is a very special situation, otherwise the court would not usually separate brothers and sisters. They will try to maintain the sibling unity. And uh, the main concern would be, would the parents be in a position to look after the children with the proposed care and control and access arrangement? So stemming from what you have just said, actually in many cases, the mother is more involved in the day-to-day care of the children and thus more likely to gain child custody following the divorce. So would you agree that it is true to say that the mother always gets custody? Um, first of all, I don't think that it is fair to say that because the mother has always been um, the person who is the main caregiver, she will be getting custody. And indeed, most of the circumstances, unless there are situations justifying giving so custody to one parent, otherwise the father and the mother will be given joint custody because that would be the best interest of the children when both father and mother would play a role in their lives. Um, joint custody is most of the time when children's decision will be made jointly. So unless 
the father and the mother is in such a bad relationship that they cannot even see eye to eye and talk to each other like a sensible adult, and they just keep fighting all the time to the point that it would only be giving more headache and issue to the children. Otherwise, the court would normally be giving joint custody to both parents. The only、um, outstanding issue would be care and control. I see. So,、um, contrasting joint custody with sole custody. For example, when a parent wants to leave Hong Kong with the children, then we can expect that the administration process will be eased by sole custody. Is that correct?、Um, it very much depends on the case because.、Um, Just because、um, one parent is moving away from the、um, the children doesn't mean that he will immediately lose custody, because at the end of the day, is still one of the parents, and、uh, they, he or she should have a role in their upbringing. Just because there's distance apart doesn't stop them from making joint decision with the parent.、Um, but a lot of time, when there is one parent who wants to relocate. There might be issues that arise when、uh, whether the children will be moving with them or they should be leaving、um, in in the same place with the other with the remaining parent. I see. So、um, moving on, I have a hypothetical question. So how can one parent prevent the other from removing their children from Hong Kong during a divorce proceedings? Um. Actually, that is one of the major concern that um the parent may have. They are very scared that、um, because the other parent、um, just take the children and fly away. In that case, that parent can ask the other parent to surrender the children's passport in the custody of either、um, a third person or their lawyer. That could prevent the other parent from leaving the、uh, country with the children. Of course, then one may ask. What if the parent go ahead and apply for replacement of the children's passport to take the children away? We can also ask the other parent to make an undertaking to the other side and the court not to apply for replacement of the children's passport without the other parent's consent. Another question for you is: If joint custody has been granted by the court, how can the parent with right of access ensure that the parent with care and control does not remove the children permanently and deprive him or her of access to the child?、Um, one of the many ways that、um, can be implemented is、um, to put an undertaking to court not to remove the children from、um, the jurisdiction without the other parent's consent. If The parent breached the undertaking,、um, then that parent may be subject to、um, contempt of court and even imprisonment. And、uh, an other way is to,、um, to insist on a written consent to be provided by the other parent, so that the children cannot be removed from the jurisdiction without such written consent. And we can apply for the name of the children to be put in the immigration department、um, in the stop list to make sure that the children would not be going away without another parent's consent. I see. So there are these protections in place. Yes. So moving on to another topic,、um, what our audience may or may not have heard of international parental child abduction. Can you tell us more about international parental child abduction? This is exactly what you、um, mentioned earlier. That is, one parent taking the children away without the other parent's consent, and in that situation. He or she needs to report to the relevant authorities in his jurisdiction immediately in order to bring forward the、um, hate proceed hate convention proceedings. We call it that is making an application to the other countries that where the children are in order to ask for an order to bring them back to where the original country is. So, what are some possible defenses that a parent may have against returning the child to his or her own country of residence? Um, possible defense would be that, um, for example, is under extreme circumstances, there's no way else that um, there's no other option for her to remain in the country. For example, the husband is um um. Beating her up, or the husband is not providing any maintenance, and she have to rely on the support from her other family members in her home jurisdiction, and things like that. And at the end of the day, it is about the children some being benefit. So 
Another possibility is that um, the parent who moved the child may say that um, the other parent had actually consented to it. And actually, we did come across cases that the mother, for example, say that uh, I'm going back to visit my parents with the children. I will be coming back at a certain date. And she never did. That kind of situation would not be a cons- well, a consent because the husband was thinking that um, they will return. But eventually, they did not return. So in that situation, the wife may say that, oh, that's the only way that we can remain in the uh, in our home jurisdiction because of certain things that the father has done to me. It would be ultimately the court decision looking after the children's interest in mind. I see. It's um, a sensible conclusion to say that the court would really uh, factor in the child's welfare and the child's interest. So uh, another question is that As we all know, many of our clients are either expats or international families, at which they often relocate to suit their employment needs of the parents. So how does the Hong Kong court address the issue of child custody in situations of relocation? It's actually very sad because um, when one parent decides to relocate and another um, does not, then where would the children go? Who should the children follow? It would be up to the relocating parent who wants to bring the children with him or her to satisfy to the court that, at such circumstances, everything has been planted for properly. So the court would actually look into the proposal to be given by the relocating parent, that is, where are they going to live, which which school are the children going to be enrolled into, who is going to be providing the financial support of the children, covering the children's basic needs such as schooling, um, daily needs, and uh, other things. And uh, the major position is that unless the court is satisfied that the children are well looked after, it would be better for the children to relocate to another country. Don't forget, we're talking about a new country that the children are probably not familiar with. The court would not make an order casually, allowing the relocating parent to bring the children with him or her. At the end, what if the children cannot adopt to the new environment? What if they are um, left behind in terms of their education? What if there are actually a lot of concern, and these are the concerns are usually brought up by the staying parent. The staying parent are legitimately concerned whether their children will be looked after. And um, this is especially important for the relocating parent to have a very careful plan. So to give an example, just saying that we are relocating and enrolling the children into a school is not good enough. He or she has to make an application to that school, confirming that the school has the space and can enroll the children into that school. And also, he or she has to satisfy to the court that the school is actually a good school. And um, the children, if desirably, will have an opportunity to look into it. And uh, understanding that um, it is the intention of the relocating parent to enroll them in that school, and uh, the children are not dissatisfied or they're happy with the relocation. That's really helpful advice from you, Alfred. So there are many practical considerations before parents decide whether or not they would want to relocate. Uh, Moving on, I have to throw out a sad and unfortunate scenario. What happens to child custody if the custodial parent dies? Okay, if the custodial parent dies, um, the governing law would be the guardianship of minors ordinance. Um, Usually there will be a surviving parent. That parent would be the guardian, either alone or jointly with the appointed guardian. Appointed guardian would be the guardian that is appointed by the deceased parent. Um, That can be done with a deed of appointment of guardianship. Of course, unless the court has declared that parent unfit for custody. I mean, at the end of the day, the court would understand that the surviving parent would have a strong bond between um, him or himself or herself to the children. And uh, usually that parent will not be deprived of custody unless there's a very good reason to doing that. 
A follow-up question for you, Alfred, is whether the court would treat adopted children differently when it comes to divorce proceedings. No, the court would consider、um, him or her a child of the family. Thank you for the clarification. So next, we're moving on to a not so legal topic, but more related to mental health. We all know that divorce can be linked to specific and long-term impacts on health and overall mental well-being. What are the specific mental health-related impacts on children arising out of divorce? Actually, we have come across a lot of cases when the children are caught in the middle of a very nasty divorce.、Um, for the, the children part, they sometimes will lead to、um, some adolescent adjustment problems. For example, they have social discomfort or learning difficulties, or they may have disruptive, disruptive behaviors. Major issue is out of their own insecurity. The first question that they may ask is, "Is it because of me that my child parents go through a divorce? Is it because of me that、um, my father and mother have to separate? Did I do something wrong?" And、uh, imagine when the parents are. Busy going through a divorce, bad mouthing each other, complaining against each other, pointing finger at each other. They may be a little bit too busy to give the enough、um, love and affection or attention to the children. That would definitely have an adverse effect towards them. And、uh, a lot of time, divorce lead to a change of environment. For example, moving to a smaller place because、um, the parent need to have, maintain two households after divorce. Whether they can adjust to the new environment, they may even have to move to another school because of that. Would that be any effect to the children? That is actually sometimes that we advise our client. Would there be any adverse effect to the children if you behave in such a way? So there are actually a lot of consideration, and these are the consideration the court would definitely have in mind when. Is asked to make any decision or order pertaining、uh, pertaining to the children's issues. I think it's very good that you bring up the guilt and the disruptions which the ch- children、um, of divorce cases may face. So, a last question is that, given all their potential impacts, what can be done to reduce the stress on all parties, particularly the children? I would encourage a smooth arrangement and settlement, in particular. Before the situation had come to a point when the parents cannot talk to each other anymore, they need to acknowledge that there are difficulties and issues in their relationship. They need to address to these issues, and if that comes to a point that they realize that the marriage is not working anymore, they have to start talking to friends or even lawyers about the situation and find out a way to attack. It. We call it an exit strategy. It has come to a point that it is necessary to bring up the issue of divorce. The first thing is, what next? Is some what is one party going to move out? Who are the children going to live with? How are they going to be maintained? And、uh, what would be the long term solution to it? Be it as Moving school, moving house, even moving to another country, these are the things that should be discussed among two parents, like a sensible adult. Without that, the only way is to rely on court proceedings. It would be a very expensive, long, and stressful process. And the court, in order to make any decision. The court would ask the social welfare officer to intervene by making family visit. The social welfare officer would definitely interview the parents, the children, the school, the teachers, and other people who are involved in the children's life. If the parents cannot communicate with each other、um, properly, the court may order that. The co-parenting coordinator be in the,、um, be involved, helping the parents into talking to each other in a sensible manner in order to address to any issue arising out of the children's life. 
Cook Parenting Coordinator is a neutral or impartial third party who serves as a separator or defaulted purple as a decision maker and facilitator of communication. He or she will help solving problems like education choices, visitation arrangement, etc. And he or she will also help parents to learn to communicate with each other in a pragmatic manner. At the end, he or she will focus on the children's interests instead of the couple's. It is indeed encouraging to know that there can be a co-parenting coordinator there to encourage effective communication between the parents. So to wrap up, um, thank you, Alfred, for your insights on the issues relating to child custody. And thank you for our audience for listening. Make sure you tune in to our other episodes of the Hip Talks podcast by checking the insights section at our website at www.hugolanip.com. You're welcome to send your comments to our email address, hello at hugolanip.com. If you found this episode to be insightful and helpful, please share it with your friends, family and business associates, along with other episodes of the Hip Talks podcast. For the hearing impaired, you can find the notes and the transcripts of this episode on our website. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Its contents do not constitute legal or professional advice.